Thanks and good afternoon. It's good to see everybody and it's good to be back in this space. It's been a while since we've been here. Uh, this space opened up probably maybe two or three months uh, before the pandemic. Uh, and uh, as you can tell, it's, uh, it's a big space and it's a space that they have, have been using. Uh, for art events, uh, and we, it's, you know, because of the pandemic, obviously, been a little bit underutilized, so we're excited as an office to be in this space and utilizing it for the first time. It's a space that we will c continue to use, and we uh, are a little bit late because of the pandemic in terms of using it, but again, we're excited to be here. Uh, these art talks, as you know, have been ongoing for about a year and a half, and they're very important to highlight uh, Latino talent in our community. We've been recognizing the great contributions that Latino artists are making to promote the arts, uh, to inspire future Latino artists, not just uh, during Latino Heritage Month, but year round. Again, we've been doing these for about a year and a half. Uh, I have a great passion uh, for the arts. Uh, I was extremely proud uh, uh, to host uh, uh, our Southeast uh, LA Arts Festival the last several years, and we're gonna continue to do that. Um, and again, very proud to be hosting uh, these art talks. Today's event is about the art of photography. And we have some uh, incredible uh, photographers here today, incredible panelists. As we know, uh, the art of photography is a an art form that has always been, uh, it's a sort of a, a more recent art form, uh, you know, uh, mid to uh, later uh, eight, uh, 19th century art form an art form uh, that um, has had, you know, p some people have been critical of it as an art form, and I think we're gonna have that conversation. Some people have wondered if the job of photography is simply to chronicle rather than as a quote unquote art form. Uh, others, my, I was thinking on the drive over here, one of my favorite books in college uh, was, uh, in my dissertation actually, was Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction by Walter Benjamin, and he talked about how uh, photography uh, had changed sculpture, photography changed uh, painting, uh, because it, uh, the, uh, the ability to create, uh, to mechanically uh, create and show people the way things actually look uh, has caused artists to uh, become more abstract, to internalize, to talk about the internal uh, aspects of reality rather than just the sort of uh, mimicry uh, that painting and sculpture were so famous for for centuries and centuries. Um, so it's a very, very important art form and obviously we know very important in our community. We have some incredible panelists today. I'm gonna have them do self-introductions in a little bit. Uh, we have uh, Marcio Sanchez who grew up in Linwood and recently won a Pulitzer Prize for photography. He's the first Honduran to ever do so. Uh, you've won one more Pulitzer uh, than I have, uh, so congrats. Uh, also feature, uh, ha glad to feature today, uh, Bill Montenegro, a local Sela artist and founder of the Sela Photography Club, which helps create community engagement among local artists. Um, so uh, thank you for that as well. I also want to uh, introduce uh, Alejandra, uh, who uh, I uh, had the opportunity to meet uh, this weekend at the uh, Southgate Art Festival. Uh, great event, um, and it was great seeing you there, and, 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 uh, and I'm glad you were able to participate. Uh, but again, this event is for everybody, uh, whether you're a seasoned photographer, whether you're just picking up a camera for the first time, uh, and, uh, and I want, again, let's uh, have the uh, panelists introduce themselves, and uh, we'll start with uh, Marcio. So uh, first, the first, first and foremost, I'm, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to speak uh, to you today. It's a great honor. Um, yes, my name is Marcio Sanchez. I'm a, a native of San Pedro Sula, Honduras, and came to the United States in, in 1983 at, a, at the age of 12 to the city of Linwood, California, nearby, where I uh, went to middle school and high school, graduated in 1988 from Linwood High School and proceeded to attend uh, San Jose State University in San Jose, California, where, where I studied uh, photojournalism. So my degree was in photojournalism. And uh, after graduating from college, I had the opportunity to travel and, and live in various parts of the country, from uh, Reno, Nevada, to Palm Beach, Florida, 
Kansas and Missouri, um, San Francisco, and eventually made my way back to Los Angeles, where I'm currently a staff photographer with the Associated Press. I've been here since 2018. Fantastic. Alejandra? Hello? All right. Hi, um, so my name is Alejandra, and I'm from Southeast LA, and specifically the city of Bell. So I was born and raised there, and I've had the chance to come back after college, where I studied economics and urban planning. Um, but even though I was very math heavy during college, you know, photography and art has always been a passion of mine. And throughout the past year, it's definitely been evol evolving and becoming very central to my life. And last year, I founded the Southeast LA Community Map, which is an Instagram page and also like an interactive Google map where people can submit stories of their lived experience in Southeast LA. And that's been a place where I've been able to connect with my community and also integrate the photographs that I've been taking in Southeast LA, which is uh, the majority of my work. Um, and yeah, just I really enjoy documenting my community, um, especially as we confront, you know, a lot of challenges regarding you know, gentrification and displacement. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I should, I, Alejandra's last name is Martinez. I, I neg neglected to, to do that in the intro. Billy? Hi, guys. My name is Billy Montenegro. I've been a resident of Southgate for 30 years, been a photographer for 10 plus years. I've shot weddings, quinceañeras, bautizos, corporate events, models, you name it. I think I've done a little bit of everything. I consider myself a photographer first, but my genre that I really like shooting would be landscape photography. So that's really what I focus on the most. I also founded the Sela Photography Club, and that was just the concept of not having a club in our region for photographers. I've been part of other photography clubs, but nothing that is within the region of Southeast LA. So that's the idea that I started that. And I started that in launching it in 2020, and then the pandemic hit, and then, well, you know what happened, everything shut down. <laughs> so um, this year, right? <laughs> it's almost over, too. Um, but yeah, thank you, though. Thank you. Thanks to all three of you. Uh, if, a general question, and we can just start and, and, and go down, or if, you know, or if you want, somebody wants to jump ahead, that's fine. Um, and if you just want to talk amongst yourselves, that's cool too. I could just listen. Uh, but the first question is about uh, photography itself. Um, is it hard to talk about photography as as art, as an art form? Uh, do do is there this desire on the part of any of you? And perhaps as a as a photojournalist, uh, do to an extent, do you just want the pictures to speak for themselves? Um, it's a very tricky um, situation talking about photography as an art medium for me. Why do I say that? Because I constantly have to weigh when, when I have to think as an artist and when I have to think as a journalist. Um, more often than not, my first priority is to document what's in front of me without in, in, any intervention in my part. What I mean is visual intervention, like, you know, just to put it more like a layman's storm terms don't be don't get cute the image is already there capture it and show the world you know so I, I i try to sort of weigh in depending on the situation whether i need to put my own personal artistic perspective on a situation or where i just need to just basically point and shoot like for example this image here that was a Pulitzer prize winning photograph when i saw that i didn't think too much of of having an artistic uh presentation i just thought Man, I really had to show the world what, what, the, what the country is looking like today. You know, yes, I had some difficult technical difficulties that I had to employ the, from my previous experience as a photographer, but other than that, not very much art. So, Alejandra? I guess for me, like a lot of what you said really resonates because, you know, a lot of the pictures that I take are pretty spontaneous. It's when I'm walking home, when I'm riding my bike, I just take out my phone, point and shoot, and then see what I end up with. And when I'm home is when I actually have the chance to really take a look and decide how I want to edit it. So for me, just because of what Southeast LA is facing, I do see it more as a form of just documenting what's happening around me. And if it happens to look good, that's great. Um, but even if it's not necessarily like it doesn't have such an artistic composition i know that just the documentation itself is what's most important for me and not necessarily like the aesthetics that come with it and especially like the part about photographs speaking for themselves too like when i post my work online 
I don't put any captions, I don't put any context. It's up to each person that interacts with it to take whatever meaning they have um, because it's also their experience living in Southeast LA um, and it's not just mine. Um, I think for me, I would approach it the other way that as a landscape photographer, I could relate to art in itself because it has the same foundations that you would do in art, in like drawing or painting, that I gotta worry about the composition, that the colors are right, that the contrast, that everything's right. Um, so I think in that aspect, as landscape photographer, I think that I, I have to focus on that too. My, where I don't have the advantage is that if a painter pins, paints this like landscape and wants to add clouds to it, right? They could just add clouds to it. For me, I gotta follow like five apps on my phone to figure out when the cloud's gonna be there, when the water, when the tides are gonna go up and down and it's gonna be a full moon and kind of thing like that. And I could go out there and photograph, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm gonna get a good photo. Opposed to a painter could just, if you mess up on, on a hill or something, just erase, like paint over the hill or make it over kind of thing. For me, I have to travel out, find out, the, find the location, and it doesn't necessarily pay out at the end. And I visited multiple, I, mo I visited the same location multiple times, and so I finally kind of get a picture, like, whoop. <laughs> like this picture here too, this is a, this sun picture, and it looks so like, easy I think in, in its sense but I've been chasing that sun ever since <laughs> um, I shot it last year and like I just been after that same looking sun since last year and I've gone to different places I've sat so many sunsets by myself like at the corner of my car and somewhere I'm not supposed to be at or something <laughs> trying to get that same picture and I just can't get it again so to me I I don't know if um, it speaks to me and hopefully it speaks to others, like if, if it makes you feel a certain way or not kind of thing out of it. Thanks. Um, how does it, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm listening to you talk and Alejandra said she tries to not put any captions. Um, I'm wondering how uh, being, a, being photographers impacts the way you impact, the way you sort of navigate the world and the way you see the world. Um, do you, is it hard for you to, look out your window and not see things as pictures? Um, do you sometimes, uh, as a photojournalist, do you sometimes uh, spend all your time looking at newspapers and not reading any text and sp instead focusing more on the, on the images? Um, how does it impact the way each of you sort of navigates the world around you? If, if you can think about it in, in those terms, it's probably hard because it's all encompassing to an extent. Excellent question, Anthony. Any guess to the soul of what we are? Well, because I'll give you an example. When you were speaking to me, I saw a photograph, you know, that I, that I desperately was trying to make because the light's coming at you from here and you're beautifully silent and it's like a work of art, right? So People say that about me all the time. So do I see the world in, do I see the world in pictures all the time? Like, I don't know how to not see the world in pictures, in other words. You know, I'm constantly framing. I'm looking at the audience. I'm making. A, I see three or four photographs. You know, I'm looking at my at my fellow artists here. I'm seeing another photograph. And I think, as an artist or as a journalist, the moment you not you you stop seeing the world as a photograph is the moment that you you lose the lo you you basically have lost the love of it or the or the or the fascination or the wonder. So I, you you will always have that as a as a visual. Uh, journalist or artist? Um, I guess in my case, since I photograph my community, I'm always thinking about how I want to document it. So anytime, even when I'm in my car, and if I have a passenger that can, you know, pull out their phone or get my phone and take a picture for me, um, you know, I'm always looking for things to document. And I think it really translates, you know, even when I'm traveling to a new city that feels a lot like where I'm from, like I automatically start wondering, what do I want to document here that evokes that same, you know, I guess urgency about the topics that I like exploring. So it's def I'm always definitely always taking pictures and especially with the digital camera on my phone, it makes it so much easier to always be capturing because sometimes when you have like a big camera, it can be difficult to be spontaneous about the pictures that you want to capture and having the luxury of an iPhone means that I can take a picture whenever I want. So I think I'm always just on alert to see what I want to take a picture of next. 
I think that's what they uh, will we eventually call like a photographer's eye that you're driving, you're walking, you see something and that's your picture. And sometimes you have the luxury of having your cell phone with you or your camera and like snapping that picture. I've gone on these drives to these national parks and I'm driving and I'm like, oh, that's a nice picture, but I'm driving on a hilly road so I can't just stop and like take a <laughs> picture, you know? So like you just take mental pictures and I think it's happened to me and I'm sure it's happened to the two of you where we have like that one picture that got away and I've had like tons of those, right? Like, <laughs> and sometimes I also make the conscious effort not to take a picture, uh, that I go out there to enjoy the moment too. Cause I've lost moments, I think personally, where I'm too focused on like trying to take the sunset, trying to take pictures of something where I've lost like time, uh, track of time and who I'm with and just living it opposed to just uh, photographing it kind of thing. It's funny you say that, but my uh, first job out of college was in an art museum, and it ruined art museums for me for the rest of my life. Every time I go to an art museum, I look at the donor board. I wonder where they raise their money. I wonder how hard it was for them to put the show together. Um, sometimes you want to stop thinking of, of that aspect of, of, uh, of where you're coming from. Um, Winning a Pulitzer Prize, um, you have an iconic photo now that's probably going to follow you for the rest of your life. Um, do you worry about that? I mean, I look up at your works up here, a, a, a tremendous amount of variety. Um, but are you worried now that, that people are going to say, oh, he did mountains, why didn't he do a protester? Are you worried about being pigeonholed at all? No, no, because I rebel against the idea of being pigeonholed into anything. Uh, I have a conflict on my social media at the moment. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because when I was covering f protests um, for three months straight and I was posting this kind of content on social media, I developed a specific audience that was, that was following my work on social media. And then I they had that expectation of me perhaps for the rest of my life, you know, but, and it's relevant to the conversation what's going on with Facebook today, right? That, that, peop, that you're being impacted, your life is being impacted by the social media platform to show the world what they want to see. So I rebel against that. I say, you know, three months ago I was, I was engulfed in, in the world that was, uh, in the world of protest, you know, but today, I'm covering something else. It's something that might be beautiful, like a sunset, or something that might be fun, like Monday Night Football last night. So I'm not gonna try to give uh, uh, someone who is following my work for a specific reason, something other than, uh, than, than what I am. What I am is a person that cover, covers the news that happens on that day, not covers the news that, 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 that I think is gonna happen on that day. So I, I take sort of a pride in the, in the, in the aspect that uh, I'm not gonna change based on what my audience expects from me or what the world expects from me. Alejandro Billy, are you worried about, uh, either of you worried about being pigeonholed? Um, not me personally, because I think I've done a lot of uh, mediums, a lot of uh, genres, I guess, in photography. Like I said, I've done weddings um, quinceañeras, corporate events, like models, like people know me that I do a lot of things. They've reached out to me that like, uh, hey, we're having a birthday, can you photograph it? Uh, we're gonna go camping, do you wanna go shooting with us? So people have expected from me in a way that I'm not stuck to one topic. Uh, and I don't feel confined to one topic. Like I always say I'm a photographer first and a landscape photographer uh, after. So, um, in that sense, I don't think I am. Um, I guess for my case, since I started taking pictures more as a hobby and it's not something I necessarily have to, you know, rely on financially, which is definitely a big privilege. I have a lot of flexibility in terms of what I want to put out there, right? I'm not really dependent on my audience or really necessarily, let's see, I, I do it for fun and I'm documenting what I want to document and it's my own personal page and so there's ebbs and flows to what I decide to post, what themes I decide to explore and I've never felt necessarily beholden to expectations that other people impose um, on my work and it's more of a community space I guess like if something catches your eye that I post that's great 
and maybe just see what I end up posting and if you like it or not. But yeah, I've definitely documented a lot of strange things that maybe aren't interesting to people. They're not aesthetically pleasing and they're weird. Um, but knowing that it's for me, first and foremost, a hobby and a way for me to express how I feel about my community, you know, I, yeah, I think that whatever I post is valid and whoever wants to enjoy it can. You, you all said no, but cool. That's great. I, I think that says a lot about your, your uh, creativity. Um, how about as, as Latino and Latina photographers? Do, you ever, uh, do people ever try to pigeonhole you from that lens? <laughs> Ignore the pun. No, that's something I want to be pigeonholed into. Yeah. Like, so what do I mean when I say I want to be pigeonholed into that? I'll give you a, a, an anecdote. When I was a young photojournalist, my first job out of college, my editor was reluctant to give me a story about Spanish-speaking people. Right, and and you know, and then the the writer who was who was writing about race said, uh, you know, Tim doesn't want to use you for these stories because he doesn't want to send you to be a translator. You're, you're a photographer. So, I I stormed into the editor's office and said, What are you doing, man? Did you hire me because partly because I'm an immigrant and I'm a brown person and a Spanish speaker that I will bring this perspective into new, you, into your newsroom? You need to use that, man. I said, I don't care if, you're gonna, if I'm going to be a translator only for this story. You have to trust my artistic intuition my, and my, journalism, my journalistic uh, skill because I'm going to turn that into something gold. So let, allow me just to be the translator for that story first. Allow me to get into the room and then allow me to develop that into something that only I can develop because that's why you hire me, you know. So, and that's, the, that's for the rest of my career. Now my, my supervisors, they don't hesitate because I've had the converse, that conversation with every person that I work for. You know, like, don't hesitate to use me because of my language skill, because of my background, because it's unique. So. Alejandra, Billy? Who goes first? Um, I don't, uh, to me, I don't think so, but I think it's part of that people in the Southeast LA, like, have never considered photography as art. So I think that's where the struggle is, that they just say like, oh, that's a cute picture. Oh, your camera takes nice pictures, right? <laughs> it's never attributed sometimes to me, like, hey, you, you captured the lighting good here. I've heard it from like multiple people, they say like, oh, your camera's really good, huh? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it is, but I'm also good too, you know? <laughs> so um, I think that's where there's the disconnect or where that's why I wouldn't be held back on that aspect, just because um, it's they don't consider photography as an art, I think, as they would with a painting or a sculpture or something like that. Um, I would say that for me, I, I do appreciate that that's a big part of the identity surrounding me as someone that you know documents my community, especially because as someone that's studied urban planning, who's very into research and you know, academia and stuff, a lot of our community doesn't get to be a part of that conversation directly. It's always outsiders coming in to tell our stories for us. And the lens that they operate with doesn't really give an accurate picture and also can't get as intimate as my work does because I can walk up to my neighbors and ask them questions like, hey, how long have you been living in Bell? Do you like tell me about your garden? Tell me about this. Tell me about that. And that's a very unique access that we have as um, Latinx people here in Southeast LA and something that I really value. And as long as I can, you know, hold on to the identity, um, I think it's going to help me, you know, just dig a little bit deeper into the things that I care about and offer a perspective that other people can never give because you just have to know the people um, to really document it um, correctly and accurately. Thanks. Uh, Billy said, Billy mentioned uh, cell phones. Uh, I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, does it, everybody, everybody has a camera now. Um, what impact do you think that has on visual culture? Um, do, do you think we look at photo photographs the same way we used to? I, thinking back from when I was in high school or college, I probably have maybe five pictures of myself from high school. I probably have 10,000 pictures of my daughter in the last year. Um, 
how do, what impact do you think that has on, 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 on photography and on visual culture, if, if any? Where, well, there's the criticism that everybody's a photographer now, you know, because the camera phones and the filters and the social media and, uh, and that that's not a good thing for some godforsaken reason. <laughs> so I don't understand that. Why? Because, you know, I'm, I love ph photographs. And we've had for decades and decades treasure troves of images that people shot of their intimate lives or, or of the world that were never seen ever, ever. They're just, they never went past that person's living room or their garage, you know? So now we have the opportunity with social media, cell phones, and instant posting and instant, you know, uh, distribution of imagery from personal lives, from uh, world events, and from uh, entertainment and everything, where it's out there, you know, and I think that it is making us more cognizant of, uh, of gives, giving us a bigger picture of what the world actually is. And it, it, it is giving us choices to say, hey, you know what? I don't agree that's the way the world is. Or yes, that is the way the world is. But I think that's a beautiful thing, you know? Do you can disagree with the way that person's seeing the world, but it could also resonate with you. And that content is out there now. It's not just, it's not, it's just some, in some basement never to be seen, or it's not in some living room photo album never to be seen. Um, for me, I mean, the cell phone and social media has been crucial to how I've developed as a photographer, I guess. Um, because that's how I document everything. I shoot everything on my iPhone. And I think part of the reason photography was hard to break into was because you had to have access to a camera. You had to have access to editing software. And now I can do that on Visco. And I don't need a film camera. I don't need to develop anything. And I think especially like in my community, you know, arts is definitely something that we don't really have access to in school. We don't really have art lessons. So a lot of folks that maybe are interested in creative expression don't have outlets for that. And I've seen how so many of my friends and classmates, once they had access to a cell phone, like they started really diving into film, into cine cinematography, into photography, because that was the one medium that we had access to and we didn't have painting classes and things of that sort. So I definitely see like the phone as a really big blessing um, for art, just because there's so many voices that were always excluded and people that didn't feel comfortable taking up space um, in art. And this is a way that you know we're getting in there and sort of creating our own voice, um, but yeah. No, I think um, cell phone photography is great. It has expanded everyone who's ever wanted to get into photography. Um, it's available to most people now. Photography as in itself, like you were saying, it's expensive. His camera, the camera I have, you're looking at the thousands of dollars. Um, just the camera, and then you add the lens, it's another few thousand dollars on top of it. Um, so, it's not a cheap uh, hobby that you can get into, but cell phones are equally as expensive sometimes. <laughs> but you can get other models that let you get into, into good photography into it. So in that sense, I do, like, uh, I do appreciate cell phones. I've gone to places where I have $3,000 worth of camera in my backpack, but I'm taking out my five-year-old phone out because that's how I want to capture it with my cell phone, <laughs> not with my camera. Um, so I do like it in that sense, and sometimes it has also, I, sometimes it has backfired too that there's a nice sunset and it's, your Instagram becomes oversaturated with the same picture 20, 50 times, right? And I went out to go photograph this landscape that I needed that, that sunrise or sunset, right? So now my picture just looks like the rest <laughs> of it. So, but doesn't devalue their work any more than it does mine, I think, too, in that sense. Um, so I, I like cell phone photography at the end, and I do like that it's um, available to everybody. Cool. Yeah, it sounds like all of you think it's sort of democratized the sort of visual experience. I, I, um, I know like in academia, for example, um, w because of the rise in literacy in recent centuries, and um, I, one historian, I remember reading one historian say that all of, I think all of 15th century British social history is based on the diaries of three people that they that survived and they found and because those folks were literate and nobody else could write um, but it sounds like you know when the, the more people are 
are creating images or, uh, or sharing images the, the, the more we know about the world, and that, I think that sounds healthy. That being said, all of you are still accomplished photographers. You're way better than me. Um, what, what would you want me to know? What would you want other people to know about what you do uh, to make images special, to make images uh, that are, that are uh, perhaps better than, uh, than what I do on my cell phone? I think that uh, uh, what I would want uh, people to know is that what makes me unique as a photographer is my background. So, you know, my personal struggle to begin with as an immigrant, that's like, that's like the, the number one visual impact in my life. And then second, the influences that I got out there in the world, you know, like I think we'll talk about that in a bit, but you know, um, when I when I decided I, w I wanted to pursue this as a, as a career, I consumed as much content as I could. So that the obsession of trying to be be, be a really good visual artist, you know, it, it, the the reason one person is Van Gogh and the other person is um, Diego Rivera is because Van Gogh lived in in uh, in rural Europe where there was nothing but gardens. And Diego Rivera lived in Mexico City in the middle of a dictatorship. You see what I mean? So thereby, the art w is just so much different, right? So it's the same thing with myself, the experience that I have here, and these other two artists, you know? That each, that we can, we're never gonna be able to replicate each other, you know? And I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, I would say that for me, the most important part of my work is just having a guiding a guiding force behind everything you do, and just knowing what common themes are always at the back of your mind throughout your life, however you grow and evolve as a person, but just letting that you know, guide you in the process. Because as Billy was saying, like, yes, there's a the photographer's eye, but, the, but behind that eye is so much more, right? It's about the things that you're passionate about. That's informing how you view everything around you, and consequently, it impacts the lens through which you view your world. And as long as you know what's driving you to do the work that you do, you're always going to have something to take a picture of. And, you know, as long as it's something that's personal to you, there's going to be beauty in it. And, yeah, just always have that guiding force behind you. So, and, yeah. I think for me, since I focus on landscape photography, one thing is that sometimes I've gotten lucky, like, again, the sun that I, I went in with the intention of shooting this, but the sun just happened to be perfect for that. Um, other ones, uh, in the back I have one of um, Death Valley, and what I like to photograph is just um, national parks that are here and the beauty of nature that is around us, but sometimes people within these communities just don't venture out to what's around us. In California we have deserts, we have oceans, we have forests, we have everything. Like It's a big state, it has so much in it, and I just want people to be able to explore that part and hopefully through my pictures, I'm able to convey that that is out there. And also, even like with this example here too, is that I'm, I'm trying to convey like examples that nature could also be found even in your backyard if you go looking for it. So sometimes you can just drive 30 minutes down from your place or you could drive five hours to Death Valley, right? And they're accessible spots. Um, so I, that's what I, what I would say different. Uh, who, who do you admire and, and why? Whether it's photographers, artists, musicians, who, who do you admire? Um, just uh, trying to narrow it down and talking about the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the field of photography, because otherwise it would be so broad, right? So, uh, you know, I started as a, as, a, as a teenager reading the Los Angeles Times uh, religiously cover to cover. But it wasn't just the right the photography that I was drawn to. It was the whole experience of being a newspaper reader, the great columnists, the great designers, and obviously the photographers. So you know that was my first inspiration, and then my second inspiration actually brought it with me, which is this book called The Americans. And The Americans was actually a book that was uh, published by by a Swiss uh, photographer that. 
arrived to the United States with a government grant to document America, and he got on in a car and drove cross country in the middle of one of the most uh, racially divis divisive times in America, and painted a portrait of America as a segregated society, you know? So it was actually a, an outsider's point of view of what America looked like. And it changed a lot of people's perspective of, of where we were as a nation at the time. So that's like probably like the turning point for me as a photographer when I saw this book. You know, it sort of changed my life and I decided that I was try, gonna try to be something like that. So. Thank you. Um, for me, the people that have inspired me have been the folks that I've been able to connect with, you know, on social media and other, you know, young photographers in my community that sort of paved the way for me to see my community in a different way, just because I think when you think of art, when you think of beauty, there's a specific aesthetic in mind about, you know, how beautiful things have to be. And being from a community that's, you know, long, faced a lot of challenges, um, I never really saw beauty in where I was from because it always seemed like a bad place for some reason, right? And it wasn't until I grew up that I really grew to appreciate where I was from and how much beauty lay beyond the physical that you were seeing, right? And being able to treasure just like really small details. Um, like for example, like there's some photographers that started taking pictures of cash for homes, right? And it seems like a very ordinary, weird sign to see when you're driving off of the freeway, but their lens really captures it in a very unique way that tells a really big story about it. So I think they sort of validated the lens that I was you know, viewing things through and just really highlighting little things, highlighting local businesses that look very ordinary um, and just seeing them in a new way. For me, I think it's probably around the same answer that my inspiration is people like you, really, because I started photography before Instagram, um, right at the time of Flickr, and like really my only, I don't have like the knowledge of uh, photography history. So to me, it's like Google Maps. It's like I go there and I see an angle and I see, okay, I could go drive there and probably find a picture. I'm scrolling through people's uh, accounts and I'm like, oh, that's a cool picture. And I've DM'd so many people, strangers, and I say, where did you get this picture at? Can you give me the location? I've done like forums and I say, I'm looking for this kind of picture. Can someone point me to a location? So to me, that would be like my biggest inspiration, just like people that have captured something in one way, and then I want to go capture it my way. And I think just like um, Silvio was saying this, if you see our pictures here, everyone is so different, right? If you see the liquor picture there, like how she photographed it is not how I would photograph it. But I'm like, oh, that's a cool place. Like, how can I go photograph it? So in that aspect, that's, uh, that's why I like photography. Everyone just has their own different eye to it and their own photographer's eye. And that's who I, how I get inspired through it. Thanks. Uh, what, what kinds of questions do people ask you uh, about your work? People think that everything that I do is like the most glamorous thing. Like, hey, you get to see LeBron today? <laughs> or how do, I, how do I get to see LeBron every day? Uh, you know, because I cover the Lakers and the Dodgers. And I'm like, so I tell people there's no shortcut. You know, like it took me 30 years to get to where I can sit in front on the front, <laughs> on the, under the basket to photograph LeBron every night. So, you know. So that's like the, the number one question, like people want advice, so how, do I, how, how they could get to be like me and photograph LeBron every day, and then I don't have an answer for that because it's near impossible, like, like I feel like I'm such, in a such fortunate position, and I'm like such a small percentage of the photographers, but, but, or the working photographers that are doing this kind of work that I couldn't even advise people how to get there, you know, so. I would say for me as landscape, Mm, I don't know. Maybe the most common question is, what part is this Photoshop? <laughs> um, just because, again, when it was cloudy yesterday, right, like, that's my opportunity that I go out and shoot something. When it's, there's a thunderstorm, where there's a storm just passed by, that's when I say, hey, you know what, I'm going to drive up the mountains. I'm going to go out to the beach and photograph the storm right now. Um, we went to that valley. It happened to rain on us, and it was like, it, it was a miserable experience, but it was great as a photographer <laughs> for landscape because everyone, the rangers were saying, it never rains here, but like, you better go there and take pictures here right now. 
So capturing those rare moments, I think is what makes people think that the pictures are fake. And that's, I would say that's probably my most question, like what part is Photoshop? <laughs> My biggest question is if I'm a photographer um, or not, because like even being invited to this talk was interesting because I've, it's not, it hasn't really been an identity um, for me for a while because it's something that I've been exploring somewhat more recently. And I always felt that, you know, I was just posting pictures I liked on my social media and people were liking it and that was it. So I think for me, it's been very new to sort of see myself in that way. Um, and seeing you know, what responsibilities come with that, if any at all. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting just because my identity has largely been you know, academia, it's been college, it's been all of that, and seeing my side hobby really evolve as a way that defines me now as a person has been very interesting. And I guess, I guess now I do feel like a photographer, um, but yeah. I have time for one more question. I'm going to use, uh, Billy said something earlier. I can't remember the, I can't remember the phrase you used though. Um, missed pictures or missed, um, you talk about pictures that you wish you had taken. Missed opportunities. Yeah, missed opportunities. So I wanted to ask all of you what's, um, throughout the course of your, your careers, your lives, there must have been one moment where you thought, oh, I wish I could have gotten that. Um, so I want to ask you that, each of you. And I also, I'm curious about um, when I think about photography, photography got really big. Um, uh, uh, there was more artistic acceptance of photography right around the, the first, second decade of the 20th century, which was the time that Freudianism and psychology really started to influence art too with surrealism and all of that, um, which always makes me think about dreams. Um, so I'm curious, what's, what's your biggest missed opportunity? And in any way, do you ever dream in photos? Do you think your photography influences your dreams since dreams are so tied up into visual, visual images? Yeah. Uh, as far as like missed opportunities go, um, I wouldn't necessarily point out to one particular instance, but I would say about missed opportunities is that Photography is a medium built on failure, you know? You're constantly failing. You fail every day. As a matter of fact, I f probably failed yesterday about covering an event probably about 20 different times, you know? So, you know, for me, it's like I'm failing nine times out of 10, and the 10th is like the goal, the goal moment. And my goal is to like fail seven times out of 10, you know? Like if I fail seven times out of 10, I'm like, wow, I had a really good shoot today, you know? So I think you have to, as an artist, as a visual artist, you have to embrace the concept of failure because otherwise you're never gonna succeed. It, it's just gonna eat you up. So uh, as far as like dreams goes, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, uh, the word dream is, 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 uni is, is, uh, is uh, key. Why do I say the word dream? It's key is because I, I'm living my dream, you know, like I have a dream, my dream job, you know, so I dream about something that I covered two weeks ago and how phenomenal that was. And I dream about maybe being a part of something in the future that's amazing. And it's pretty cool because sometimes it comes true, you know, like I dreamed about covering the World Cup for many years, you know, because that was like for me, like the pinnacle and now I've covered three, you know, so, so yeah, definitely, I definitely dream about photography, that's for sure. Uh, for me, missed opportunities, I think like you're saying, is there's been so many, especially in landscape photography and clouds, and I keep mentioning clouds because cloud is what sometimes helps add to the picture, and they're always moving, so you go to a destination with this in mind, and you don't get there on time, something's in your way or whatever the reason is and you miss that opportunity in fact my dead valley picture that that i have there that was i guess a success from a failure that I, like a missed opportunity because at the distance there was um the mountains and the sun rays were coming just perfectly out of it and i was getting my gear ready i was getting my tripod blah 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 and then by the time i looked up everything was gone and that was like me like a minute or two kind of thing so in desperate in desperation there i guess i was just up in the mountain just seeing what else i could shoot like and everyone's thinking landscape everyone's thinking like look at the mountains and look at this thing 
but right below is at the lowest point in the in the uh, west region or in the United States is the lowest point at the basin and from where I'm at it's the tallest point you can see and you're still looking at the, uh, the lowest part in the US and it's a 5,000 feet difference and that's what you see there on that photo is just tiny people and how little they look compared to like where we are at so like you said like out of failure you try to make something um, how many have I felt I, I, I don't I don't dwell on them because there's too many <laughs> um to what do i dream i just dream of the next place i want to go photograph um not so much the technical aspect or where i'm going to be sitting at but where it would be nice to go um go sit next to a cliffside go to the desert um just the next destination that i want to go to Um, so for me, a missed opportunity was actually as recently as last week when the city of Bell decided to destroy some gardens that senior folks had planted along the LA River. And we had neighbors that had been growing things for over five years. Um, they were growing pomegranate trees, they were growing fig trees, and then out of nowhere the city just announced that they were going to go in and get rid of unauthorized plantings. And the next day, like I saw my neighbor, Francisco, a neighbor, Olivia, like they were getting ready to get as much of their plants as they could to take home before the city just came in and destroyed everything. And when I got wind of it, I, I had this really big regret of not documenting what I had seen before because it was years of beauty that my community had gotten to appreciate. And with no transparency, they removed a very valuable public space as was important to the city of Bell. And it was such a, you know, it's such a shameful thing for the city to do. And the first day I was out there, um, they had already started clearing one part, but luckily they hadn't got into my neighbor's garden just yet, but the sun was already setting. And I asked him, like, can you give me like a quick tour? Just show me everything that you have here before the city comes in and gets rid of it all. And for over an hour, he was showing me all these beautiful plants that he had been caring for um, while his wife um, had been dealing with um, Huntington's disease. and. He was sharing with me how um, she passed away last year and the garden had always been this very sacred place for him to just find some respite, especially during the pandemic. And, you know, that regret of not having come in sooner, that regret of not documenting um, this place that was really special to him and just only getting those few video clips and one or two pictures and then the city coming in and getting rid of everything. and. That's, that's actually why I, I really want to be here today because I think our, the, the damage is done already. The garden has been destroyed. My neighbors are distraught and there's been no transparency from the city whatsoever. Everyone tried to reach out to the city. We were calling numbers, getting redirected here, redirected there. And that's a facet of art and photography that's crucial and it's, that's sort of where that dream comes in. I'm, I'm documenting my community because I already know that things are going to change. I already know gentrification is coming. And I dream that this isn't something that goes into the archives and is a memory that's lost to everyone. Because ideally, we get to preserve our communities. And that's, that's why you know, today is very important to me. Because now that that you know, garden is gone, that I documented right before it was destroyed, I want to make sure that you know, your office can help us find a way to rectify that injustice that happened. Um, and moving forward, you know, making sure that we're more transparent about that process just so it's not a dream, it's not a fantasy that our community gets to stay and we get to keep the things that we really treasure here in Southeast LA. So, very poignant way to, of closing. Thank you very much. I want to thank all three of, uh, of the photographers for being here. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank everyone. Uh, in attendance and who's uh, watching uh, uh, on, on the internet. Now, I, of course, want to thank the owners of Horchateria for always being uh, such great community partners. Again, thank you. Thanks to all of you. I look forward to everyone uh, joining us next time. Good night.